Go with me to this text that we have for us from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6. Before I open this, may I ask God to help me. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to look into your engrafted word wherein salvation for our souls can be found. Help us now, Father, to accept that which you give and the courage to employ the walk of faith that you require of us. Help us not, O oh Father, to grow weary in this effort, but by your strength and by your encouragement and by your blessing, may we continue to do this until you call us from labor to reward, that we may glorify you and celebrate our love for you in everything we do. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, again, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's where we are tonight. We did 11 yesterday. We're in 12 tonight. I don't know who Emmett Fox is, but he wrote this some time ago and I'd like to share it with you. There is no difficulty that enough love will not conquer. There is no injury that enough love will not heal. There is no door that enough love cannot open. And there is no gulf that enough love cannot bridge. There is no wall that enough love will not throw down. And there is no sin that enough love will not redeem. It makes no difference how deeply seated may be the trouble or how hopeless the outlook, how muddled and how tinkled how great the mistake, a sufficient realization of love would dissolve it all if only you could love enough. You would be the happiest and most powerful being in the world if you could just love enough. I don't know who Emmett Fox was, but these words capture the essence of what is spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about love. I want you to understand that love in the chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is the flower in the middle of the garden. The garden starts in chapter 12 where it's concerning spiritual gifts. And in chapter 14 it says pursue and ask us and shows us how to employ spiritual gifts. Chapter 13 tells us what love is all about and how to employ it and how it is our tool and it is actually the armor that we wear against carnality and against the practices of the evil one, Satan. It teaches us how to conduct ourselves. Yesterday, I brought it to you in this way. I said it is the lubricant that causes us to be able to work with each other because all of us are different. When we all got baptized, the Bible still says that when asked by the people, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or forgiveness of sins. And you will receive what? Say that again. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's your gift. Now, each one of you got that at baptism. Everybody. God is not going to hold it back. He gives everybody the same treatment. You all got something at baptism. Everybody. There's no denying it. When he added you to the church, you had a gift. We all don't have the same one, though. That's where the conflict comes in. Because sometimes I want to say mine is better than yours. That's adolescent, I know. And that's immature, I know. But that's why we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have to have him help us to understand where we need help. Because sometimes we think we've arrived when we got that gift. My gift is I count money. Therefore, I'm better than you. All right. All right. Are you following? Oh, I know how to preach. Therefore, I ought to have more influence because I'm better than you. I'm an elder. I ought to be able to tell you what to do. Rather than show you how, tell you how. This is where friction comes in because we're still in this flesh. We still got an appetite to be a man, to be a woman, and to be in control. Even around other people, we're not willing to compromise that sometimes. We have to grow up. 
Let's read. He said, when I was a child, I used to do these little childish things. But now that I've become a man, anthropos, all woman, I have to put away childish things because what? God teaches me a new way, a better way, a better way. God teaches us if we'll come to be taught. Why do we put off coming to be taught? It's a test, I want you to know. God's letting you choose where you want to be. You see, it's going to be hard to be in heaven in love with God who is love and you don't love him. As I said last night, you don't have to be able to preach a sermon and you can still go to heaven. You don't have to be able to teach a Bible study because that may not be your gift and you can still go to heaven. You may not be able to give as much as some of these other people in here give because you ain't been blessed to get that kind of job and you can still go to heaven. But I'm here to tell you, if you don't know how to love me the way God loves me and loves you, you're not going. You say, are you judging? No, I'm telling you, you ain't going. He said, the greatest of these is love. And he said, God is love. Watch this. He said, he that does not love, does not love, does not know God. First John chapter 4 and verse number 8. If you don't know how to love, you don't even know God. That's the same thing he told the woman at the well. You worship, you know not what. That's the reason when we come to church, we're so bored if we don't know God. That's like saying you don't know your wife, you don't know your husband, you don't know your girlfriend, you don't know your boyfriend. You ain't got no relationship. You don't know each other. You're strangers. Now, if you don't like God down here, let's be honest about it. Stop lying to yourself. If you don't like him, you don't like him. Do you know what you got a problem with? I'm going to get to my text in a minute. I, I don't think I'm going to get there. Do you know some of us are infected? We got an infection. And you see, the enemy is like the flu. He comes in, as Jude would say, enters in on a lab. When you get the flu, it's because your body can't tell what just got in it. The virus looks just like your regular cells. And because it looks just like your regular cells, it can actually commune with them and overtake them. And the next thing you know, they're multiplying in your body off your cells. That's the reason when you catch one virus within a couple of hours, you are sicker than you've ever been in your life because it took your body over because your body didn't recognize it as an invader. Some of us are not recognizing that those we sometimes call our friends are not our friends. They're infected. Now watch this. I want some word on this. Can I get some word? You got your Bible? Go with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, and verse 15. I think I'll start there. I'm going to get to my text in a moment. But I got to get this right now. Would you read that for me, brother? Uh, Hebrews, 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 chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12. I want us to read together. I want us to be able to actually hold to this word because this is where it's at. This is where salvation's at in the word. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life and these are they that testify of me. Jesus is in the word. Okay, what does it say there? Uh, let's, let's go back up to uh, verse number 12. Watch what we're supposed to do when you got the spirit of love until something happens. Start with verse 12, please. Wherefore, Wherefore, lift up the hands, lift up the hands, which hang down, go ahead, and the feeble knees, yes. and make straight paths for your feet, go ahead, lest that which is lame be burned out of the way. You know this. This is what called bearing one another's burden yes. to so fulfill the law of Christ. Christ wants us to help each other. He wants us to help each other, not hurt each other. Be careful how you speak. You might hurt somebody. Somebody said, uh, sticks and stones may what? Break my bones. But words what? 
That is a lie. That's right. That's right. That's right. That is a lie. I'm telling you. I done got old now. You can tell I really don't care nothing about what nobody thinks but God. That is. I don't. You say you get in trouble that way. Jesus did too. And he didn't care about nothing nobody thought except his father. It took me a while to learn this. Keep reading, brother. We're on our way. But let it rather be healed. Yeah, let it rather be. Go ahead. Follow peace with all men. Go ahead. And holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Without which. With, without what? Without which. Without which. No man no shall man see the Lord. See the Lord. Now, why is it you ain't got no peace? Keep reading. Looking diligently. Looking diligently. Lest any man fail. Let, go ahead. The grace of God. Go ahead. Lest any root of bitterness. The what? Bitterness. What? Bitterness. A root of bitterness. That does what? Springing up. Springs up. That does what? Trouble you. Trouble you. And thereby. Thereby. Many. Be many. Defiled. defiled. All it takes is one of them bacteria to get or viruses to get in you and the whole church gets a problem. That root of bitterness is an infection. Ain't got no business in your body. It takes away your peace. Mm -hmm. You say you love the Lord, you say you're serving Jesus, but you ain't got no peace, you're troubled, you're angry, you're upset, you're mean-spirited. And yet you say you serve the Prince of Peace. Well, How is it you serve the Prince of Peace and you have no peace? It's because you got a root of what? Bitterness. And you're contagious. Well, You don't keep it to yourself, you pass that disease on. And it, it conflicts, and, it, and we're all being tested to see what we're going to do when it comes our way. Can I, can I make the devil, can I expose the devil? Expose him. Expose him. I'm going to show you what the root of business looks like. Watch it. You ready? This ain't no hard book. In, Revelation is a little puzzling sometimes. Now, I got something straightforward. Ain't hard to see. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Start with verse 10 for me, please. And I heard a loud voice saying that. Somebody is hollering in heaven. <laughs> Go ahead. Now Wanted everybody to hear this. Now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. Go ahead. Now has come salvation. What's that? And now has come salvation. Now has come salvation. And strength. At, Go ahead. And the kingdom of our God. And the kingdom of our God. And of his Christ. Go ahead. For the accused of our God. The what? The what? The, the what? The, the what? The accuser. The accuser. You, you know that's a word for Satan. You, you know that, don't you? <laughs> the accuser. And what is the accuser doing? What is the accuser doing? What is he doing? Which cat has accused them before our God day and night. Accusing who? God's people. God's people? My brother? Yes, sir. Us. Us. The devil's up there talking about you right now. Y'all think that's so funny, don't you? He is. Ask Job if he didn't. All right. He is up there talking behind the scenes on Job, and Job didn't even know it. You don't either, do you? All right. But he's accusing you. Be careful how you accuse people because you're doing his work. Be careful. Because I just told you, words have impact. They have power. They have influence. And when you're running around tearing people down like the accuser, you're working for him. I didn't make this up. Ain't that in your book? Preachers, can I get an amen? <laughs> That's the word. He just warned you. Beware when somebody brings you on somebody else. I tell you why. Because Jesus said, if you got some problem with somebody else, Jesus said, handle it this way. Yes, Go to them yourself. Go to them yourself. Yes, don't right, tell please. John. Don't tell Raymond. Preach. Don't tell nobody but whoever you got your problem with. That's right, preacher. It's a top secret. And the rest of us won't catch y'all's disease. Preach. The church will be better off and you're showing you love the congregation. One of the worst colds I ever caught in my life was right here in this building because of, and I'm gonna call her name, Rodney McFall. 
Rodney McFall should have stayed at home. He had the flu or something. And he came, and not only did he come, he hugged me, Brother Wright. I went home with sick for two weeks. So contagious things hurt. So God is saying, when something is between you and somebody else and it's not working because y'all's lubrication ain't working well, keep it quarantined. And you keep the church healthy. And you're doing yourself a favor because God's testing you. You're following this church. This is important. Now, what I just showed you is what God said. I didn't make that up. You can exegete it. You can go home and check it. I hope you will. I didn't give you an eisegesis. I give you an exegesis. That's God's word. And God wants us to pass this on so the congregations will be strong in love. Watch this. The Church of Christ is not known because it's got an iconic name. That ain't what makes the Church of Christ. I'm thinking to get in some more trouble. And I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to go there. Y'all ready for this? Y'all put up y'all seat belts and hold on because I'm ready to go somewhere. It's, it's not because you got an iconic preacher. It's not about whose name's on the board out front. It's not about who attends there. Whether they're aristocratic or whether they're high in the community strata. That ain't what you're supposed to be known for. I asked, I was in Lebanon two weeks ago and I asked a question in Bible class. What are we known for? Great. And a brother in the back of the building said, hypocrisy. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right, Steph? That actually happened. Of course, my wife rebuked him and said, we'd like to be known for more than that, please. Great. But what are we known for? Stop and soberly think about that. What are we known for? What causes us to have our report in the community? What are we supposed to be known for, church, that causes us to be the church of Christ? What causes that? Let's look at what the Bible said. Let, let Jesus tell me and tell you. John 13, 34. Now watch this. This is important. Are y'all ready? Jesus Christ said to his disciples, a new what? I give to who? You. That you love one another. That you do what? Love one another. That word's agape. It's unconditional love. That's not phileo and that's not eros. That's agape love. That you love one another. As he gives I have you, loved he gives you. you a model. He gives you a model, doesn't he? As I have loved you. As who has loved you? As I have loved you. As I have loved you. I want you to love each other like I have loved you. That you also. That, that you also. Love one another. You transfer it. Yes, sir. Now after I've shown you how I can love you in spite of you being as you are, you can love each other in spite of how you all are. That's right. And what is this going to prove? Read. No, no, read that, brother. Read that. Read that. By this all men shall know. By this all will know. That you are my disciples. That, that you are what? Are my disciples. That you are what? My disciples. That's how you know the church of Christ. That's right. That's how you know the church of Christ. Now, I don't care what else you've come up with in time, but that's what Jesus said the church of Christ would be known by. Can I do a, a remote text to confirm my point? Go with me to Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Paul and Silas, Barnabas and Silas, I'm sorry, went up to a place called, what? 11:26 Acts. Uh, uh, Barnabas and Silas uh, went up to a place called Antioch, mm -hmm. and they taught much people there for two years. You see, it's the teaching that makes the disciple well. like Christ. Right. That's the reason we shouldn't be missing no Bible studies. Right. Amen. Because the devil, Jesus said, is like a bird ready when the word gets in your heart, he comes by and picks it up and takes it away before it can take root. You can't even get out of the church building sometime before you talk about somebody else and something else rather than the sermon. Sermon don't even get the last past the pew. You talking about something else before you get to that door over there. Because the devil just took it right out of your This is how it works. These, these are not archaic statements and old fables. These are God's way of telling us how to deal with life. This is life. 
The devil don't want you to know nothing about God. Amen. And the more you know, the more he knows you're going to be a problem for him. So when you get it in your word, in your head, he comes right by and starts talking to you about some foolishness that has nothing to do with the relevance of the word you just heard. Well, he plucks it right out before you get to your car. Well, That's the reason we don't have no conversations about it. You see that? That Jesus taught that. What did I tell you to read? I said Acts 11. 11 26. Read that. Read that. Read that. And when he had found him. Watch this. When he found him. He brought him unto Antioch. He brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. That a whole year. A whole year. They assembled themselves they with assembled the church. They themselves together with people. And taught much people. Taught much people. And the disciples. The disciples. Were called Christians. They were what? Called Christians. Where? First in Antioch. Watch this. They were called that. Because somebody saw something in them. Yes, sir. That's right. It didn't say they called itself that. It says somebody called them that. That's right. Because Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciple. Watch this. After you get baptized, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. That's how you learn how to be just like Jesus. So when people see you, people say he's like Christ. You don't have to say it. You don't even have to tell them what you are. They know what you are. Because of the fruit on your tree. Wow. Unless you're full of bitterness. Right. If you're full of bitterness, you're dead. Right. Right. I'm going to show you. The bitterness is a, is a sign of some death here. Dead things don't smile. Right. Stay with me a minute. Dead things don't smile. Dead things don't laugh. Right. Dead things don't greet. Dead things don't shake hands. Right. Dead things ain't even friendly. Right. Dead things don't sing. Dead things don't embrace. Dead things don't forgive and they don't help. Dead things just plain dead. You know there's one thing about the dead though. The smell. That's right. Now you hold on, y'all don't got all upset now. Here's what I'm going with. It's a spiritual thing. The dead can influence. When I was a boy, we'd be walking down through the country, and sometimes you get a whiff of what was known as a dead rat. I didn't see the rat. Didn't know where he was at. He's over in some high weeds. But I smelled him. And I knew he was there. His influence permeated that whole area. And if somebody didn't put some dirt over him, he did that until he was completely consumed. Dead things give off an odor. It's a bad vibe. It's a bad attitude. It's not some kind of cloud that comes out, but you can't see it. But you can still feel it. That's what the dead do. Those are characteristics of the dead. Whatever you do, you don't want to be dead. So when you're singing on Sunday, you don't want to be weak, sick, or sleeping. Are you hearing me, church? Sometimes, that's what he talked about them over there trying to commune with Jesus. They were weak, sick, or they were sleeping. You don't want to be either one. When you come to the house of the Lord, what do you come to do? You come to celebrate your love. Roberta Flack used to sing about that. Some of y'all don't know Roberta, but she was a popular lady. I celebrate my love for you. When I come in here, that's what I'm celebrating, my love for God. And if somebody's dead, I know it, but I don't want to be bothered with the dead. I know that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when people are singing up in here and their spirits are lifted and they are lifting up Christ, which is drawing all men unto him, that is what the light of Christ is all about. That's what love will do for you. But if you don't love Christ, you're still stuck in muck and mind with a root of bitterness that'll keep you dead. And the dead don't have no fun at church. Well. Ain't no fun at church. Because the living God's in the church. Because you came here to worship him. And God is love. 
What is a characteristic of love? It always gives without looking for anything in return. It always gives without looking for anything in return. It always gives. Jesus said it this way. I came not to be ministered to, but to minister. I told you all yesterday from verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. I told you that men of God there is anthropos. It means ministers here. He said men of God. Some of us think that's just talking to the preacher or the preachers that are here this evening. But he's talking to all of us. Now the preachers have the greater responsibility to share and teach and teach it appropriately. But the teachers are the, not the only ones mentioned there. We are all in this fight. We are all needing our armor on. And the devil is going to hit anybody who's not well clad. And you can sit there and point at the teacher and say he's not. But if you get a shell or if you get an arrow, it's because you didn't have your armor on. Now, why are you looking at his armor shaking? Your armor ain't even on. Don't let the devil get you off into this pointing at the teacher saying, I would go, but the teacher got to get better. You know what the challenge to that is? I'm not going to tell you to get better. Maybe you ain't supposed to teach. Maybe you just learn, need to learn how to be patient. You know that's the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe you just need to learn how to be patient. Can I take you all somewhere? It's in Galatians. And I'll be almost finished in a moment. I never did get to my text. Right? Galatians chapter 5, is it? Yes. I want you to look at this. Verse 22 is where I'm at. It says in verse 22, and see, you've been born of the Spirit because you got the Spirit when you got baptized. You got a gift. Look what he said to you about this gift. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Now look at those three. Those three are the way you and God have y'all intimate relationship. The love, the joy, and the peace. Peace of uh, uh, the, the uh, God of all peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. When you are worshiping God, there's a joy involved, and the whole thing is based on love. And love is not love unless it's shared. Love is not love if it's kept. That's the reason in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The word was with God is pointing out that God the Father and God the Son were together in the beginning. They were facing each other. They were sharing. The source of love is the Father. He gives love to the Son. And the Son gives love back to the Father. And the thing in the middle, the verb in the middle, is the thing called love that is the Holy Spirit that serves to allow it to flow. You see that? Now that's what those first three are for. Now look at the next three. Look at the next three. What does it say? Long suffering, that's a patience I was telling you about. Since you don't think the teacher can teach, learn how to sit there. It's a learning, it's a lesson in that. And learn how to prepare yourself. Preach. The Bible told you to study to show yourself approved that's right. unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Is that what it said? Watch. It said what now? Patience and what else? A long suffering, you say that? Gentleness, godliness. godliness, stop right there. Those three right there are the relationship the Holy Spirit helps us with each other. Can you see that? Long-suffering, putting up with each other. Kindness, did you say that? Did you say, what did you say? Gentleness. Gentleness, gentle toward each other. What else? Goodness. Goodness, goodness toward each other. That's our relationship with each other. The first three are with our relationship with God. The second three are our relationship with each other. Yes. The last three is our relationship with ourselves. What does it say about that? Faith. Faith. Meekness. Meekness. Temperance. Self-control and temperance. Against us there is no law. Now them last three are the relationship we have with ourselves. What did it say again? Faith. Meekness. Faith without works is dead. Yes. Go Tem walk by faith and not, not by, by sight. sight. Go ahead. Temperance. Go back to the second one. Meekness. Meekness. Power under control. Discipline. And the last one? Temperance. Temperance. Okay. Control, self-discipline. Yes. Manner of attitude. That's your relationship with you. How you control you. Is that not right? Look at that. Yeah, yeah. See, God just didn't throw that in there. He had purpose. You just got to look. He wants us to know him. Preach. 
That's the reason he spoke in parables. He said, those who really want to know will search it. That's right. He didn't want to make it real easy. Now you see, here we are talking about love, because that's just what it's all about, church. If we can learn how to love, we can do right by God, we'll be closer. The church will grow. Preach. You can't help but make it grow. Because see, you're not in control then. Because see, God said, I will draw. I will draw. You want to see the church grow? Put him to the test. He said, try me and see if I don't do it. But as long as you've got all kinds of bitterness, accusations, unrest, and pretending to be something you never intend to be, preach. You'll never get there. Because a house divided cannot stand. Preach. And it doesn't mean it's a split down the middle. It means it's 15 splits here and 25 splits there. Nobody talks to anybody. Nobody knows anybody. And then when something happens, we don't even know each other. Why don't we know each other? We meet here every Sunday. Let me give you a challenge. Meet somebody new next Sunday. Because sometimes we get occupied with a little section of the church and we just socialize there and then we leave. We don't even go to the other side of the room. Who was over there today? I don't know. Claude, sister, sister who? Who's in the hospital? Who is that? Oh, that woman who wear the hat over yonder. Left side of the room, back there by the thermostat. Preach. That's who, sister, who, who. And that's the only thing you know. You know, if we're family, you ought to know who's in your house. Preach. Let's Preach. talk real now. If you're family, you ought to know who's in your house. You don't need no strangers in the house. Preach. That's that spooky stuff. Preach. You got strangers in the house, intruders living in the basement. Preach. You don't even know they're there. Now, that's spooky stuff. Lord, have mercy. You ought to know who's in your house with you. They, am I right, John? John, tell me, hey man or something, just not wave at me. Preach. Just wave at me. That's all Preach. I need. I just Preach. need some confirmation. Church, this is serious. This is totally serious. I want to show you one thing before I stop about what God did for you in love. And I'm taking this from the Old Testament, okay? Can I do that? Bear with me just a moment. There's a custom in the Greek, I mean in the Hebrew faith. And it was done in ancient times. In the holy days, one of the holiest of holy days, you probably heard of it, is Yom Kippur, atonement, the Day of Atonement. It's a great ceremony. The high priest, yes, they did. The high priest on that day would stand in front of the people with two goats, two goats. Each goat had to be identical in appearance to the other. The high priest would reach into an urn and pull out two lots, one in each hand. Each lot had a different Hebrew word on it, inscribed at its top. He then placed one on the head of one of the goats on his right, and another on the head of the other goat on his left. One stone identified the goat that would die as the sacrifice for the sins of the people. Yeah. The other identified the goat that would be let go. So before they could be a sacrifice, there had to be the presentation of the two goats before the people and the appropriation of the two destinies. Now, what did Messiah do? Before he was sacked, before his sacrifice, what took place was this. He was presented before the people for the choosing for the appropriation of his destiny and the destinies of the two. They had to be two presented identical to two men, and this two men presented to the people. Only one could become the sacrifice, so Messiah had to be one of the two lives presented before the people in order to be chosen as a sacrifice. And according to the ordinance of Yom Kippur, Kippur, I'm sorry, 
The other life had to be let go. So what happened to the other life presented that day? He was let go and his name was? I want you to get your Bible for a minute. Barabbas is his name. We're in Matthew 27, 15. I want you to look at that word very close because I'm going to bring something out for you that Jesus did for you and for me. And he summarized it completely on the cross a little bit later. 27, 15, what does it say? Matthew 27, 15. Now at that feast, at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner. Go ahead. Whom they would. Yes. And they had then a notable prisoner. A notable prisoner. Called Barabbas. Look at the name. Barabbas. Now, Ba in the Hebrew means son. And Abba means father. Yeah. When you look in Mark 14, 36, it said we call Abba father. Yeah. So that confirms that Abba means father in the Hebrew. And then when we look in Matthew 16, 17, when Jesus Christ had just been affirmed as being the son of God by Peter, he said, well done, Simon Bart. Jonah, yeah. Bar Jonah, yeah. son of Jonah, for yeah. flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Right. Look at Barabbas, Barabbas, son of the Father. Yeah. Jesus the Christ, son of the Father. Yes, sir. You have to be identical. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. God had that there. He got that thing. And if you look at this translation in the message, it says Jesus Barabbas. The names were identical. We don't see this. Yes. But the son of the father had to be identical and they were both presented at the same time. The thing that condemned Jesus was when the high priest said, are you the Messiah? All right. Are you the son of the father? Great. He said yes. And when they were standing there, they said, who will you let go? Mm -hmm. Who shall I release unto you? They said, Barabbas, the son of the father. That's what they heard. That's right. All right. The son of the father mm -hmm. took your place. Great. Because in order for God to die for your sins, he had to become like you. Great. Right. Flesh and blood. Great. And in you, he had to sacrifice and die in you for you. Praise. That's right. Yeah. Are you getting this? Yes, yeah. sir. This goes deeper. Yeah. Of the seven things Jesus said on the cross. He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right. The one fellow that was up there, he said, this day you will be meet with me in paradise. That's right. And then he looked at John and he said, behold, man, your mother and woman, your son. Yeah. He gave the care of his mother to John. The next thing he said was this. Father, why have you forsaken me? Do you know why he forsook him? Do you know why he forsook him? I want you to get this. Yes, sir. Do you know why he forsook him? Isaiah said, because of your sins, we are yeah. separated from God, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he forsake him? Did he forsake him because of our sins? The Father forsook Jesus because of our sins. But Jesus didn't forsake us and come down from the cross. He stayed with us in spite of that. For if he had come down, we would have. It's more to it than just a phrase. There's meaning in what he said. Father, you've forsaken me, but I'm not going to forsake them. I'm going to carry it out to the end. That's what he did for you, and you can't say it for him. Well. If he had forsook you, because they were sure talking, and the devil was sitting at the foot of the cross saying, If you are the Son of God, come down and then we'll believe you. They wouldn't have believed him if the whole mountain blew up. I'm telling you, no, they wouldn't. And Jesus, Jesus even told 
something. He said, no matter what I say, you're not going to let me go. That's right. Read your text. Did you know Jesus did that for you? Pray. We take so many things for granted. Yes, sir. He didn't leave you up there. Even though his father left him. Because of you. And because of me. That's how serious love is. Pray. I will never leave nor forsake you. That's his promise. And God cannot lie. He loves you that much. And then he said, love your enemies, even if they're in your own household. Lord have mercy. Love your enemies. Because if I could love you hanging there in that, I don't know what you're up against, but if I could love you hanging there under those conditions, you can get around to loving somebody else. I hope these words will encourage you. I never did get to the text. But <laughs> and I'm not going to disrespect your time because I know you got something to do tomorrow. But I hope and pray this will encourage you that love is the key. If we can't love, we're going to be in a world of hurt. You may not be 